Okay, let's get started. So today's course is on uh, advanced topics in cybersecurity. Um, today, what we're going to go over is uh, we're just have brief discussion about what we're what we mean by when we talk about cybersecurity, um, the importance of compliance platform automation, uh, new and emerging frameworks, legal frameworks, and then risk management. And then again, we're gonna talk about how all that circles around again to the reason why we would we would have a compliance platform. So when we talk about cybersecurity, we're not referring to like, you know, breaches um, or data uh, dumps or, or, you know, products um, like, two-factor authentication, what we're going to refer to cybersecurity in this context is um, the frameworks, NIST, CMMC, PCI, FedRAMP. <clears throat> These frameworks are uh, are a large group of, of requirements that, that the government or uh, organizations have created in order to, you know, you have to follow these frameworks and they're, they're like rules that you need to follow and and then prove that you you follow them by providing evidence. Um, it's a list. Some are longer than others. Uh, they're around 160 to 100 uh, requests that you perform an activity or an action for each one. And uh, once you've done that, you have to usually provide what's called an artifact or evidence. And evidence is is proof that you've completed that that particular control. We call these lists of requirements controls. Not all of the requirements are like going to be defined well. Some of them just say that you need to have, you know, external security on your building. They don't really tell you what you need to do. do does that mean I have to have dogs roaming the grounds or do I have to have cameras or locks or or card keys or what does that mean? It's it's up to you in some cases to perform these actions as best you can. And then it, in some scenarios, the vendor or the government may require that you perform a, a particular action at a particular with a particularly descriptive uh, result like encryption. They, they require a certain level of encryption, a certain kind of encryption, and they uh, they don't want you to use encryption that's not strong enough. So they're going to they're going to call out a minimum requirement for that. Some of the controls require evidence doc and some require documentation. So you, uh, if you're going to have a, a control that states that you're going to train your staff on how to uh, handle, you know, secure documents, you're going to want to uh, show that you have a, an actual uh, PowerPoint presentation that you give to your staff who has taken it so far, who, who has not and that kind of thing. So, you're going to create these controls. So what well, all those things we discussed, they need to be compiled somewhere. Um, you know, you need to have some sort of a, a, a you know, a repository of information. And uh, you're going to also need it to be able to have, you know, functionality like letting you know when something is due or who is supposed to be working on it, or what uh, what part of your organization is responsible for it, or what it is that was done for it, and what was shown that is the actual completion of it, and that is you know what we what we have here is Lionfish. So we're going to use that platform as an example. Um, some of the platforms, uh, you know, have other components to it they will you know run a scan of your of your network some of them don't um, some of them have uh, tools that you can use inside that will help you create you know different results that you need for your controls a lot of them almost all of them will show what controls are cross-platform you know cross uh, framework so if you have a control that is available in NIST, it might also be uh, able to complete something in ISO. So if you have to be ISO compliant and NIST compliant, 
you're going to want to have the ability to to share those controls and evidence across both of those areas and make a link to them. And to do that, you're going to need to have some sort of, of a compliance platform that shows that there's a link. Um, cyber, uh, Lionfish also has training modules and uh, recommended vendor sp spots and, and areas where you can perform tasks and 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 also the ability overall to show these things to uh, to an auditor or to other members of your your company like the board of directors or the CEO or a stakeholder. So again, the importance of a compliance platform is is huge. You need to have it in order to really be able to move forward and automate your compliance journey. So emerging frameworks, you're like, well, how often does a framework emerge? Well, current, re recently, uh, CMMC has gone through a transformation. Uh, so CMMC was just CMMC, now it's CMMC 2.0. So it went through some quite a bit of a transformation, which means that you need to be aware that there are frameworks, there are emerging frameworks like CMMC and that they're changing frameworks. So ISO changes, uh, the requirements change. You need to be aware of the fact that these are not just set in stone. They are um, they are changing on a regular basis, not constant, but if you have your finger on the pulse of your, your framework, you can go places that will discuss, you know, changes coming up to your framework. They really overhauled CMMC, so, that's a great example of something that went through a big change and uh, all the, not all the controls changed, but there, they shuffled a lot of things around. There were, there are different levels. They changed the leveling of it that you had to be in like group one through six. They changed it like through from group one through three. I mean, there, it, it wasn't something static. So definitely there was a change that took place. You need to be aware that there are changing uh, components to frameworks. And then also um, some of the frameworks have co the controls we discussed earlier and those controls change as well. Like encryption algorithms change and you need to keep up with the change that's occurring in the encryption algorithm. Now, <clears throat> you're like, where can I go to to make sure that if anything does change, I'm on top of it? Well, again, we'll beat this to death. It's your, your compliance platform will tell you. It will, you know, you don't have to do the research. You don't have to sit there and, you know, go pouring over documentation every month or week or quarter or year. You can just look at your compliance platform, Lionfish, and it'll tell you, okay, this is new. This is how this will need to look now. And you're like, phew, I didn't have to do that myself. Thank you. Now, how about the cyber cybersecurity landscape? Um, what is changing in that? So there are a bunch of emerging changes. A lot of them have to do with the the aggressiveness uh, and and uh, attack vectors and threats um, that come from the outside world. Those are always changing because hackers are are you know manipulating their their activities. But I put four in here that are coming in the future that we need to worry about. Um, the fact that attacking ha hackers' attacks are gonna change, that's never really gonna go away. But here are four things that um, are going to be more, are gonna be different in the future. Um, data breaches we've all heard of, they're getting more, they're getting more intense. AWS just experienced a data breach recently that was the largest data breach in the history of data breaches. So that's going to be a term you're going to hear all the time you know this data breach is the biggest data breach that's ever occurred and so you have to really take care of yourself <clears throat> with data breaches and, and react to that by doing like dark web scans and having the, the right security set up for your users if you don't these data breaches will start to affect you i have seen the result of a data breach affecting someone um you know they're they're doing those tra money transfer uh, scams and those are from password compromisation so you have to be careful there of course we've all heard 
of AI. And AI is, is changing the, the landscape of attack. I'm sure everybody's starting to hear stories about uh, fake, um, you know, fake videos, fake phone calls, fake, everything's fake with AI. You know, it can figure out things. Well, the future of AI is that it's going to start making connections. It's going to start being able to understand that you have a bank account at Wells Fargo. You also have, uh, you know, you use this particular two factor. Uh, your your friends are called this. Your dad is this name. Your mom is that name. It's going to start compiling these attack packages that are going to be able to be uh, very effective in 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 you know stealing money and data. IoT, what's that? Well, not only are your you know computers and your uh, your laptops and your phones very vulnerable that also are your devices like your uh, nuclear power plant uh, control panel is vulnerable to attack. So IoT like will protect that power plant control panel. IoT will protect that power grid station um, you know uh, control system. It will protect uh, you know that that uh, potato cutting tool that you have hooked up to your network but it just has like a firmware and it just sits there and, and cuts potatoes. And then all of a sudden it gets angry and it starts cutting and tries to cut people. And you're like, Whoa, what this happened? Well, somebody attacked your OT, um, which is like a different level of your network, uh, your OT network. And so you're needing, you're going to need to protect your OT network. And there are lots of companies that protect OT out there now. They're growing uh, Nozomi, Clarity, Drago. Uh, those companies will um, protect your OT. So yeah, your computer betrays you and now your, your cutting machine betrays you. And so you need to protect them from attack. Like a car, for instance, would be another good example of, of a device that doesn't really have such a super advanced compute system in it you know it doesn't have a pro it might have a processor but it would be very small it could just have ram it's just doing very little but all of a sudden your car is under the control of some sort of hacker this is something that should really all along have been most important for everyone but it doesn't seem to be uh the most uh protected in emerging market and that's mobile devices um there's very little mobile device security systems out there if you look uh but they're growing that that industry is, is coming out now now that everybody is worried about their mobile device uh data and all that so um you know some sort of mobile device security antivirus on your phone is not enough you need some sort of mobile device security system now especially if you're going to be traveling um out of the country uh and you have like a mobile phone you're going to want to make sure that it's protected that your SIM card is protected and all that. So and look for MDS to make it a splash soon and, and people start pressing that forward. All right, what are these legal frameworks? GDPR, CCPA, PIPEDA, LGDPA. What are they? Well, they're, you know, GDPR is like the European Union's, um, you know, data privacy, uh, you know, framework so the gdpr if you read it and the ccpa if you read that which is a california personal you know protection it talks about really your personal data um being not being able to be moved around or used without your permission but it's it's gonna you know you, you have to pay attention to these things for your other frameworks like pci and hipaa uh not so much with cmmc or 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 uh, FedRAMP or, um, for, or, or, you know, C, uh, NIST, because it's, you don't really have a lot of personal data at stake inside of, um, inside of those, those frameworks, but you do inside of HIPAA and you do inside of PCI. So these laws are, are going to dictate what you need to do with that data, what can be done with that data. And so if you read all of them, they're all similar. Um, they're not a, there's not a lot of difference in between each of these. If you love to sit there and read like some very boring stale day, you know, 
documentation, you can read the GDPR and the CCP. I have read it. I don't really find a lot of difference between all of them. But the, the thing here is, is that they do have slight differences. How are you going to tell what you need to do for LGDPA versus GDPR? Well, I'll tell you, you can have a compliance platform and it's going to help you. It's going to help you along. It's going to say, okay, for PIPDA, you have to have this particular um, statement or type of, of consideration that you took into account. And you're going to want to make sure that you're following all those rules. Those are four. There are more coming by the, by like, you know, CCPA is California. If you could imagine that. So CCPA, California versus, you know, TCPA and you, you know, Mar Maryland, P, you know, and, and Oregon and oh man, wow. You have all these hundreds and hundreds of legal frameworks now and you have to take those into account and you're going to be like wow that's too many w which ones do i follow which ones do i have to follow again your compliance platform is going to be uh it's going to be in there helping you working with you making sure that you stay compliant if you check that box i have to be ccpa you know certified your compliance platform is going to know it now and it's going to help you along it's going to make sure <clears throat> that when you work on your frameworks that you align, that they're aligned with CCPA or they're aligned with PIPDA. So you're gonna wanna make sure that, unless you wanna sit there and read each of them every time a new one comes out and make and try to figure out, do I follow this? Does my controls follow this? Go back and look at your controls. Oh, I don't I don't mention this in my controls, so now I gotta go fix it. It's It's massively time consuming. And um, I definitely know that I've dealt with many co companies that have dealt with uh, European, um, you know, vendors, and they all ask if you're GDPR compliant. And then they, you know, how do they check? Well, they have a list of questions that they send over. Sometimes it's, it's 10, 15, sometimes it's 50, 60 questions. Do you, how do you deal with personnel's, a person's data? Um, you know, give us a workflow diagram of, of, of an individual's data and where it comes in and how it gets processed, where it's stored and what happens to it after. And then there are also questions like when a person requests their data, how do you give it to them and what and what method do you, you, do you produce it to them in and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of things that go into their questionnaires that you have to follow. So if you're not, if you're just like, oh yeah, I think I'm GDPR compliant. Well, Think again, you aren't, because if you are not, if you don't understand the flow of GDPR or PIPEDA, you're going to, you're, you're not going to be able to answer that question correctly. And when, when you get a lot of questions from these companies and you don't answer all of them, or you don't answer, you only answer 75% of them, what's going to happen? Well, they possibly might not give you the contract. They may put you in a lower contract tier where you can only work on certain components or parts of a of a of a, a thing you might not be HIPAA compliant you might not be PCI compliant so leverage your compliance platform in order to um you know in order to make sure that you're a bit a, able and a bit you know to to meet these framework requirements Okay, last the last course we had was on risk management. So if you want to go back and listen to that whole course, that whole that whole uh, instance, you'll understand that there's there's risk management. Now, risk your risk approach we talked about we talked about risk methodology. You need to do a risk assessment. Risk again touches all of your frameworks. It touches all the components of your framework. So you have to come forward and, and do a risk analysis and say are we GDPR compliant? If not, what are the risks of not being that? Or if we are GDPR compliant 75%, what are the risks of us not being the other 25%? If, you know, if we are PCI compliant, do we need to also be GDPR compliant? Because those things I've mentioned are all time consuming. They t consume your time. So what happens is, is you have to go through your GDPR compliance 
and look at it all and make sure you're compliant with that. Is that is that there are risks there? Absolutely. There are risks if you don't complete your CMMC every single one. Can you pass an assessment? What are the risks of you not passing the assessment? So you have to do an analysis of risk across your legal frameworks, across your frameworks themselves, and try to figure out if you're going to be able to uh, meet your risk um, footprint. You, you need to be able to do these things from the last course we talked about in depth to understand um, how risk affects your infrastructure and and your ability to meet these these frameworks these legal frameworks and uh and so you're going to need to understand risk and i i created a risk approach document methodology document i created risk assessment um uh documentation and then i had a risk template uh from last from the last class so if if you want to you can ask jeremy to give you all that risk, uh, you know, documentation, and he'll provide it to you. And you can listen to that risk class. But the risk documentation is is as in depth as you know your like the GDPR document. So there's a lot of words in there. There's a lot of information that will help you manage your risk. But it is a it's a part of your uh, it's an advanced concept. So it's not something that you normally will just go through all your controls. You could just pound through your controls and just be like, uh, yeah, you know, I do two factor authentication. I do encryption. I do, I have cameras. You know, you could pound through those and that's fine. And you might be able to get like maybe 95% of all your controls completed. Um, but then there is a, there are risk, um, there are risk components to those uh, frameworks that they call out. So, you know, it might not it might not be as easy, is what I'm saying as as like just buying a you know ticketing system, is is easier than risk management. So, risk management is going to have to include you know multiple individuals in your organization, someone from HR, someone from the executive team, someone possibly from your operational um, side of the house. If you're a one man show, you know, that's you, but if you're not, you're going to need to include all those people. You're going to need to have some sort of a risk meeting where you talk about, you know, disaster recovery, disaster recovery, business continuity. I have a business impact analysis document that I included in the last um, in the last uh, class that you can also download from Jeremy. Business impact analysis is going to have a lot of information uh, about how your company will run in the event of 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 some sort of issue going on like a weather event or a hacking event or some sort of issue with you know theft or or espionage or whatever it is so those are those are like more work to pile on to the sim the basic simplicity of meaning just controls some of the controls are simple like do you change your passwords on a regular basis now we don't have to have a, an advanced class on that but we do have to have an advanced class on the fact that these legal frameworks, risk management, um, the changing of frameworks, the changing of some of the base requirement levels of each of these different um, of these different controls. This is something that you need to take into account. So, what is it that we need to do? We need to have need we need help. Um, especially if you're a one man show, if you're, if you're, even if you're a two or three man show, what do you need? You need help. You need to have a compliance platform. You need to use lionfish, um, or, or anything else. Do not attempt to make, uh, to make all this work on your own. Don't think you can, you can use Excel and SharePoint to kind of, and word to cobble together some kind of, of a compliance response. It's just going to be a disaster. Um, so especially for an auditor, you're going to get charged twice as much to have an audit done than if you were to use your compliance platform to track your plan of actions, your SSP, your your task list, um, all the things that the that the uh, Lionfish platform does. Again, Jeremy can show you the Lionfish platform 
he can give you a demo of it and uh, and show you how it works. But you just need you, you, if you're going to be compliant or if you're going to help other people become compliant as like an MSSP or or a provider of services, you got to have this thing. It's just it's it, like I said, I, I, I was around before these platforms were around. And I was doing this before that they were being done. It was, it was a you know a cluster because there was so much data. Uh, it would even get twice, maybe three times as bad because I had a customer was CMMC needed to be you know NIST eight hundred one seventy one compliant and ISO. It just really the lines were super blurred because all the different controls had to be labeled. Some of them have to be labeled ISO. Others had to be labeled NIST. And there were all these different cross controls. We were trying to figure out if one control we made would fit into two or three of these ISO controls. And we didn't know because no one at the time was telling you that the like like the Lionfish platform does that this particular control is compatible with this other control from ISO. So we would just be guessing. And then when we get audited, the, the auditors would be all no, these controls don't fit here. You have to make different controls. It just took a really, really, really long time to go through. I mean, 40, 60, 80 hours of, of, of time um, spent on this. And and 60 hours at whatever rate you're charging, it gets up there in the dollar figures for, for money. It also gets up there if you're going to spend 60 hours doing this yourself, you know, building your own thing. It's just going to be, it's not going to be worth it. So I suggest that you get a platform like Lionfish. Again, they can show you all the features and functionality of the Lionfish platform. Jeremy can show it to you, but absolutely go for, you know, using that. And that's, uh, that's what you need to do. All right. Let's get some questions. Let's get some feedback. What do we got? Anybody need to raise their hand or put put the chat in the chat or we can do it. I'll give it some time for you guys to come come up with some good good questions. So as I was saying to again, Jeremy has the risk analysis risk assessment, risk methodology, business continuity plan. He's got so many good documents that I've given him for this that you guys will really benefit from all that because it's great because it it's, you know, you don't have to do it yourself. <laughs> and you can use those items as evidence inside of your of your compliance um journey, you know. It's so hard to come up with some of these approaches and methodologies super difficult because you have to go figure out is this compliance document the right does it say the right words um is it current is it functional do i need something different and yeah it's a pain trust me i had to come up with it myself you know so i know it's a pain and when you're when you sit there and you have to search the internet for documents and sometimes they're they're you know behind some sort of subscription wall then it's tough if you were going to start a risk assessment assessment where would you start a customer questionnaire and is this something you've created yourself as a template yeah so the risk methodology and the risk approach i created are where i would start i would look at that document and it kind of guides you as to where you what you need to know what you need to start a customer if you're if you have a questionnaire for your vendor i provided a vendor uh, risk assessment methodology document to jeremy so if you were going to ask your vendor uh, about the risks that they are going they possibly could incur i've included the the vendor risk assessment questionnaire uh, and approach and methodology document to him he, you can grab that if it's for you and a customer is going to ask you those questions, then your the methodology and the approach document I gave Jeremy is going to talk about all the things you need to take into consideration when you're going to look at risk in your own organization. And then I've also included a template where you can just jot down each of the risks and what level of risk they are 
and if they're going to be in and when you're going to deal with them and who's going to deal with them. I've given that template as well to Jeremy. So you can grab that from him. So he's got a lot. He's got like five risk documents that you can use to um, to to handle risk. It'll it'll cover risk from top to bottom because it has your risk. It has a business, you know, business impact analysis for yourself, which is I, I would also do because a lot of companies ask for a BIA. And, uh, and, and then I also included the risk template for your vendors, which are your customers, because some, in some scenarios, you have to make sure your customers are also handling risk appropriately, just like your, that, like your, uh, vendor is going to have requesting of you. I hope that answers your question, right? Yeah, good, good. Great. Anybody else have any other good questions? That was a great question. Anybody else have anything? Give you a minute or two. Hey, Gregory. Hey. Hey, real quick. Um, I, I think there's one other option that I, I don't know if folks have thought about, but it, it's something that um, I, I think about is using the platform. I, there, there may be some private sector, you know, regulations that say you got to have specific companies of, of a specific size doing your assessment or your validation. Um, but, but I really love the platform because a lot of large companies will have an internal audit department and it's real great to be able to use this platform to go in and evaluate your organization once a quarter, however frequently you want to do it before you write a big check to have to have somebody come in like a price water or someone like that. Um, and, and then find out you've got all these compliance issues that you need to get addressed. It, do you see uh, the benefit of the platform helping in situations like that? Yeah, a Price Waterhouse uh, Cooper's assessment might might be eighteen thousand dollars for even for just a small. So yeah, saving. I mean, figuring out ways to save money on an assessment um, or an audit is is critical. And if that guy has to spend more time than he should. Then 18 becomes 28. I've, I've seen it where a person has not been super, you know, like doesn't have a compliance platform and they're very disorganized and they're they're not set up the way they should be. That that it's come out where they've slapped another ten, fifteen thousand dollars onto the audit. So you're talking about a thirty three thousand dollar audit just to go over the 110 controls you have because they're so disorganized or they're not filled out properly or you don't have a BIA or you don't have a POAM. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have the platform, it's going to make things worse for you. Um, and and that that comes in the form of dollars. So those are these auditors from these these accounting firms are going to charge you like a like a base rate of the cheapest one I've ever seen has been even has only has been eight thousand dollars. And that was to do a SOC one audit and so SOC one if anybody knows is very very small set of controls so eight thousand dollars just to do that from an assessor uh was a lot yeah absolutely thank you yeah so if anyone's wondering these these audits are they're costy they're expensive the they'll these they'll you know come in at 18 20 24 32 um thousand dollars so they're not cheap and it's something that is very real it's a real number they hit you with and you're like what are you going to be doing so uh, rick just said he saw one for 30 uh 30k so yeah absolutely it's expensive it's not something that is funny you know it's not even something you can you can avoid in some scenarios we have a a customer who who uh, deals with Lockheed Martin, um, and they had to get one, and it was like twenty two thousand dollars. So it's just, and they have a compliance platform, so they they didn't have to you know get a change order for another eight thousand dollars. 
Yeah, and and Rick is mentioning that not only does the auditors do like your stuff, your side of the house, which is the cybersecurity, they may do a financial analysis. They may even do an operational analysis and the engineering team has to come up with, you know, has to be answering certain questions. So yeah, if your ducks are in a row, um, then absolutely you're going to come out as the hero because you're not going to make anything cost more money. And, uh, and if you have a compliance platform there, it's going to be great for, for your side. Yeah. Ops analysis was definitely, is definitely on there. So Rick mentioned that the ops analysis and the financial analysis needs to be done. So yeah, you want to come in as a hero, as somebody that the board of directors looks at and goes, wow, this is great. You know, it's just something they don't have to worry about um, versus the financial analysis and the operational analysis, which might be, which they might not have a platform for. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, cool. Um, thanks for everybody for coming. And uh, this will be available. Jeremy will make it available to everyone so that you can re-listen to it later. Um, you can approach Jeremy about the past uh, the past documents that I've given out on other uh, classes. There's so many good ones, especially last week, which was like six, six documents, especially the BIA. Have it, not having to make your own BIA. Wow, that's great. That's a bonus. It's like worth going to the class just to get the free BIA. So everybody have a great uh, weekend. Thanks. I'll see you next Friday. Thanks.